Hello, and welcome to the Ecom Sales Tax Podcast. I've got Dan Peisner here and Jason Parr. Welcome, guys. Hey there, Ryan. Great to be here. Yeah, thanks for being here with us, guys. And uh, I had an interesting question today. Um, I had someone submit a question that I wasn't prepared to answer, uh, but he's concerned. He's a SaaS provider, um, and he you know, sells software as a service. And he's been solely within the state of Illinois and he's registered there, of course, and he knows the laws there, but he's, he's recently been expanding. His first one is into Texas and he has more, uh, you know, businesses are looking into acquiring his, his software, using his software in other states. And, you know, before he, he commits to these um, contracts, he, he wants to know kind of what the rules are when it comes to sales tax in these different states. And I was hoping you guys be able to enlighten me and you know other people that have a similar issue. Yeah, you bet. It's a great question because, um, well, there, there's, there's two ways that you expand, right? So a lot of times when someone thinks, hey, I'm just in one state and I'm expanding into another state, what they may not understand is that uh, because of new nexus laws uh, that came about because of Wayfair, uh, they, they may have expanded into other states and have a responsibility in other states without their knowing, right? They're saying, I'm in this state and now I'm moving into another state. And that usually means physically moving into another state <clears throat> or making sales to customers in another state. Um, but when you sell software as a service, you might have customers in multiple states as well as uh, uh, internationally as well. So uh, it, it comes back to the question that we always ask. Um, what do I do next? And next is an acronym for uh, understanding what my nexus footprint is, and then also understanding what my taxability is. And so uh, anytime we have a situation like this, we, we try to understand everything that um, the individual sells. So in this situation, they indicated that, hey, I, I sell SaaS, right? And that's pretty straightforward. Or I sell an app and I sell an app on different platforms or I sell it direct or um, I install it myself. And so you might ask other questions. Do you do installations? Um, are there training services that you provide? Are there other fees that um, you generate or do you just provide SaaS? And so um, when it comes down to what is my nexus and what is my taxability, it's important to know all of the things that you sell. And selling a product is one thing, and there might be some reason that something's not taxable, um, say like a dietary supplement or food, um, which is not taxable in some states and obviously taxable in other states. Well, services are the same way. Services actually can be a little more complicated because typically services wouldn't be taxable unless they're specifically enumerated in the law. Sorry for using uh, legal terms, but it just means that the state says, hey, we want to tax that service, and it wouldn't normally be taxable. Um, but then those services that are deemed taxable might be exempt or non-taxable for other purposes in a given state. So I don't want to complicate it too much, but in relation specifically to software as a service, since that's the focus of the question, I would just turn it over to Dan to tell us a little bit about uh, software, not a huge history, but a little bit about traditional software versus software as a service and how the states have handled um, this situation from a taxability standpoint. Uh, thank you, Jason. When we think about software traditionally, we think about at first what uh, originally came on those very large floppy disks, then on slightly smaller floppy disks, then on uh, CDs, DVDs, and, and now even downloaded electronically. And uh, when the, the states wrote a lot of their laws on software, it still came on those traditional disks. And now uh, where the, the states are just starting to catch up to the, the electronically downloaded software, in some instances, uh, we've got this new idea of, of uh, software as a service where the, the software is run on a a separate it it's uh, hosted on a server and you you log on to the the software remotely and run what you need to run uh, when you think about nowadays about salesforce and uh, uh, and and, the, and it's uh, in similar software uh, then 
that's really uh, software as a service. And uh, the states, as the, the states try to figure out or are looking at that and try to figure out how to fit it into their traditional taxing matrix, uh, some of the states have specifically passed laws to, that says that it's taxable and others, rather than doing that, have tried to find creative ways to reinterpret their existing laws to, uh, in, in order to find a way to say that software as a service is taxable. For example, um, you, Ryan mentioned Texas. Texas actually uh, has a, a service called data processing that, that they passed uh, back in the, I believe, late 80s that, that basically said anything with data input, data processing, data manipulation, it made a big catch-all and the, the, the Texas comptroller decided software as a service fits in there. And to, to make the taxability picture uh, all, the, all the more cloudy, Texas gives you a 20% discount on it and says that 80% of that, that price for software as a service is taxable. Uh, Arizona took a little bit of a different approach. They didn't say that it's a service. They actually said that you're renting that computer and they classify it under the, the rental category as taxable. So you're, you're not retailing, you're not offering a service, you're renting the computer that's, or you're renting access to the computer that runs the software. It's a very unique way of looking at it. But as I said, they're, they're trying to, to fit it, kind of fit the service into their existing matrix and find a way to tax it. Uh, and in, whereas in comparison to that, California, what traditionally one of the, the biggest uh, tax, when you, when you think of, of big tax, you think of California, they don't tax SaaS at all. So it's really, it's a little bit of a patchwork and you really do, uh, when, you, when you're going into a, getting customers in a new state, you really do need to look at the, as you gain nexus and, and exposure, you need to look at the individual taxability, look at what that state taxes and look at it, what rate it taxes it and, and then even be, be careful as to that uh, Connecticut has traditionally taxed all digital goods and services at a reduced 1% rate. And uh, coming up here, very they just passed a new law coming up here shortly. Uh, they're going to revert to the general sales tax rate. So everybody's uh, SaaS bills are getting ready to go up as far as the tax goes. Wow. <clears throat> so, <laughs> so what you're saying is it's really simple. <laughs> Isn't everything in sales tax simple? I thought it was very simple. <laughs> right. That's always the joke. So, you know, it, it can sound very complicated and, and it can be complicated. I'll say less so complicated, but it's, it's complex. Um, so to answer your questions in, in most cases, which we want to do here, we want to try to help somebody who might sell SaaS or sell an app or um, uh, some sort of service like that to understand, you know, what, what do I do next? Because, um, and what does it mean to say that I'm expanding? Um, because that can have different connotations. So uh, one thing I want to point out here, when you're thinking about what is my nexus footprint or what is my uh, expansion into other states, you need to consider physical presence and economic presence. Uh, a lot of people will come to us and say, okay, because of Wayfair now we're one year in, right? Everybody understands. Uh, we're now one year in, and there's uh, most states, if not all, have an effective date with an economic threshold. And so you really need to look across the U.S. and try to understand what your footprint might be. Well, they might look at a particular item that they sell or um, a, a selection of sales, but what they need to look at is gross sales. So the state, when they establish a threshold, they're looking at uh, total sales into that state. Then you're looking at the taxability of those sales. So a lot of times people will come and indicate, listen, uh, I, I know I need to register in other states because I've exceeded the threshold. So we always put a pause there, take a look at the threshold, take a look at their sales. Then we have to look at taxability. So in the case of software as a service, we would provide you all of the, the information that you need to know where what you sell is taxable, at what rate it should be taxed. And then obviously we can help you uh, set up your platform uh, or your ERP system to, to manage that properly so that you're, you're collecting at the right rates or at the right base. As Dan indicated, it could be that the base that you tax is discounted like in Texas at 20% or the tax rate that you impose on what you sell 
is at a reduced rate from what the general rate might be. And so that needs to be set up correctly in the system. So in, in that regard, we, people come, they feel like I've exceeded the threshold and then they reveal, hey, listen, uh, here's another aspect of what I do. I, I sell software as a service, but I also provide installations and I also provide training. And uh, I either do that in-house or I do that online um, or um, some other format in, in which I might not enter the state, but it's possible that they do. And so we need to understand if there's uh, potential that physical nexus was established at a previous date to the effective date of economic nexus. We're always looking at that um, because we want to make sure that we don't just tell you to go register and get compliant if it could expose you to historical um, liabilities where tax should have been collected and it wasn't. So it's important to know when Nexus was established and what type of Nexus it is and what the taxability of your product is. And so uh, we would say again, when it comes to software as a service, uh, we would take the details that were provided to you, Ryan. Uh, we would look at uh, Nexus thresholds and we would look at the taxability of software as a service across all states. And then we can readily uh, respond back and indicate where we believe a registration should occur or where there might need to be some other way to mitigate potential exposure uh, that could exist because Nexus may have been established at, a, at another date. But we can give you some peace of mind by going through the process of identifying your Nexus, establishing what the taxability is, understanding what your responsibilities might be, and then you can move forward with confidence. And uh, so we'd ask you to continue to reach out, uh, ask us questions, and we'd be happy to um, walk through this with you. You know, uh, thanks, guys. This has been very informative. Um, I've even learned a lot, and I really appreciate uh, the time you guys have taken to answer that question. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. Sounds great. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan.